Samuel Johnson said, if you're tired of London, you're tired of life. For in London, you have all that life can afford, even on the streets. So this is the bench I used to sleep on. You're also sleeping with rats and foxes. I only have two choices, whether I travel back home or I end up in the streets of London. I didn't think I was really brave enough to do that. Taking away that perception that you can't do something, there's always something you can do. I said, I've been in your position, but now you could be in my position. Let me talk to you about where I was and the times I've tried to kill myself through my addiction and sexual abuse I suffered as a child. 20% of people might not like you at all thing and they think you shouldn't be there. You can be homeless, you can be homeless, you can be homeless. Everybody can be homeless at some point, but it's not the sort of thing you think about, is it? It's a brand new day in London. It is still 5 a.m. While many are still sleeping at home, others are about to wake up. That's if they haven't been woken up by one of these. The park will open shortly, so they should hurry up and leave before anyone sees them. This is the ruthless routine of almost 8,000 people living roofless in London. Although most might look old and worn out, the reality is almost half of the homeless are youngsters under the age of 21. While those can be seen on the streets, an estimated 300,000 are finding shelter on friends' sofas, in hostels and at bed and breakfasts. And I'm about to turn that number into 300,000 and one. My name is Majd. I'm an international student finishing my master's at Goldsmiths, University of London. My journey in London started in September 2015. As a student, it was difficult to find a suitable place to live in. I first lived in two parts of East London, a month later, I finally managed to settle. I am living in one of the university's halls. And today, I'm leaving. I received this notice one month ago. But through this period, I found it very hard to secure a room for two weeks because I need to stay here in London until the end of June, have my exams and my classes. But nothing promising yet. So today, I'm leaving. I'm leaving now. I'm out and fortunately this is what, all what is left with me because I managed to send the other clothes and suitcase back home. Otherwise, uh, I am a little bit desperate because all the people that I spoke to and all the websites that I've tried, spare room, country, etc. Like people, they ask for a minimum of three months or six months contract. And I don't need it and I can't afford it because the prices are very high for two weeks. So yeah, as an international student with no resources here in London, I only have two choices, whether I travel back home or I end up in the streets of London. I found a hostel that charges 21 pounds per night, but I have to sleep with four strangers in the same room. In other areas, rents start with a four digit number. Hey, everything. I'm gonna take the suitcase. No, oh, it's fine, it's fine. It's 
truly it's a blessing to have someone, a friend who you can rely on here in London. And I'm very glad that my friend Yasin accepted to accommodate me at least for the weekend. And then we're going to look for something else next week. Um, what I'm experiencing now, I'm sure that many people went through this. Um, they, they end up uh, going to a friend's place or sleeping in bed and breakfast or something. They, they really experiencing the rough sleeping. And this is what researchers call hidden homeless. Like you have a shelter, you have a place where to sleep, but it's not yours. You're not at your home. The fear of living on the streets was haunting me. I had heard in class of an award-winning tour that is led by homeless people, and I'm about to look them up online. The guides of Unseen Tools know all the secrets of living on the streets of London, and I wanted to know more about them. I decided to contact this guide, Viv, who's a Norwegian lady with a twisted fate. Hey! Hi. What's up? All right. How was your day? How did yeah, it start? Not bad, not bad. Good. What did you do yesterday? Uh, you had tools yesterday? No, Friday. Friday, okay. Yeah. Oh man, you have what? people on the bench. You want to know what it's like to sleep in this place? Yeah, so how did you end up coming to this place and sleeping in this place? I met yeah. somebody in a handout queue outside this building yeah. and uh, he invited me into the park. Oh, cool. You get invited in. You don't. You can't just move in. Yeah. You get invited in. So you slept on all these places. No, I only slept on that bench there. Even if it's in the streets, no one sleep on it. It's you. Yeah. It's you. While I'm here, it belongs to me. <laughs> so this is the bench I used to sleep on. When I lived in this park, we didn't have them bolted down, and sometimes my partner and I would put the two benches together, and we sleep on one bench. I mean, you wake up in the morning, like you, you sleep the whole night here. Uh, yeah, like you didn't feel like insecure or fearing something might happen. No, because you're sleeping with other homeless people and they look after you. They look after you. So yeah. there is a sense of community. Yeah. So if you... Brilliant. If, if you're in here and somebody tries to attack you in here, somebody else will stop it. Viv first came to London in the 70s to marry a British man she fell in love with on a holiday. They started a family. Then her husband became abusive. She left him and became homeless for 16 years. Here we go, inside the jungle. Yeah, we used to hide our bedding behind here. We had it in big, big black bin liners and we put, bushes, uh, we put branches on top of it. Yeah, some of these sleeping up there as well. Oh, okay. The worst bit is when in the winter, you're walking around, you're trying to find somewhere to sleep, you've got all your bedding on you, and it's cold. Or waking up in the morning with almost frost on your feet. That's another one. Yeah. We usually woke up at five o'clock. And it took us a bit. Yeah. And we had to get the crates back by six o'clock because they started building the fruit store by six o'clock. <laughs> Yeah. I'm really, I'm, I'm really hidden homeless now. I'm, we're not joking. You're gonna try and come out on the no, street? No, no. I found, I found the place where to stay. So you can, yeah, you on can surf sofa. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sofa surfing though. Surfing. Yeah. But that's, that's, yeah, that's like you said, hidden homeless. Yeah. That's what I did. Well, this is where she used to have her hot cup of tea in the morning. Go all the view. Playing with the pigeons, the flying rats. It's, yeah, it's illegal to feed them. Really? Yeah. And have a look at, see where I used to sleep, where I used to make my little house with wooden okay. pallets. But this is where we got our water from. Water? Yes, water. From where? From that door. Oops. I'm drinking too much. Cheers. <laughs> These are the secrets you find out when you're on the street. I built my building here. It starts here. Here? Yeah, so it'd be... It took Viv like three that. days to build her own house. She okay. first laid pallets down, Going then put cardboard, then, then newspapers, way. then cardboard again, and then, then carpet on top of that. She then built her house around that, like a little cave. 
I had a gas, one gas ring, a frying pan, a kettle and a pot. You know, you can't make a whole meal, but you can, you can get yourself something warm. You had access to hot food, but you do get tired of sandwiches because that's what you see a lot of the time. You get served sandwiches every day of the week. And I was never burgled. <laughs> I felt safer here under this bridge than I did ever living in a hostel in Camden. I felt more scared living in a hostel with all women than I did on the street. A squeezy deodorant, yeah, uh, you can have inside your, your jackets like that or, you know, your sleeve like that. The other one is, I use nail varnish. You know when the nail varnish is really liquidy and you open the top and you can sling it at people, sling it in their eyes. That's what you need to do. If you get attacked, that's what I'm saying. Viv is going to show me where she bought her pallets from, which is at the back of a very famous hotel in London. But before that, she's about to reveal a little secret. We want to go up there. See, people sleep here. where the yeah. warm air comes out. Oh, man. They sleep in front of this air. And some places you have it where it comes out really low. So they sleep low on the ground down here and you get the hot air coming out to you. It's nice, isn't it? This is where people sleep in the winter. Yeah. That places like this. And so you get some uh, single streets as well where they got vents like this to come out on the road, on the pavement. This is where we get the cardboard from. From where? Just here. They usually pile them up in little piles yeah. here. See this stuff? Oh, this is a good bed. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the top of an ottoman or something like that. See, this is the sort of thing you could pick up. I can sleep on this one. Yeah, you could sleep on that. This is where we used to come for breakfast in the morning. Okay, only breakfast, so... Yeah, only breakfast. At that time, yeah. it was just a breakfast place, but you could also get showers here. Ah, cool. And uh, who's running this place? It's a Christian group that runs this place. Like yeah. most of these places, yeah. And you can take your old clothes. If you take your old clothes off... To wash them? Yeah, you, you put oh. them in a bag, then you give them into them, and they'll wash them for you, and you can pick them up clean the next morning. Oh, so it's one yeah. place to get your clothes washed as well. Okay. They, come here. they come between three and four. What do we gone. have here? Oh, these are the horrible spikes, yeah. Then these are the ones that are supposed to be made illegal. They're meant, not meant to be here. But what a strange place to put it. You can't sleep there anyway. Since 2012, I think, they started bringing them out, something like that. But some of the councils made it illegal now to put these things down. You've got these ones, then you've got these concrete things. They've been built in front of windows, just like concrete tiles. I hate it. Wrong, well wrong. Not right at all. You don't want these around. Why, why prevent? You're trying to stop people sleeping somewhere. What's the point? They should open up big warehouses, they should open up empty buildings in London so that people can spot it and so they be used, so people got somewhere to live. It's wrong the way they treat the homeless in this city, or anywhere else for that matter. Nowadays in London, those who don't have a roof to put over their head don't even have a place where to lie on. I'm here in this nice area of central London and I'm walking by this bench and actually if you have a close look at it you will notice that it's not a normal bench. Look. Actually it has been made to prevent crime. It has been designed to prevent homeless people from using it, from lying on it, from sleeping on it. Skateboarders also won't be able to use it or jump on it. Look. They will fall. And also, it has been made to prevent people from littering. And this kind of bench, called also Camden Bench, has won three awards so far. Keep Britain Tidy in 2010, the best practice for reducing crime in 2011, and the best European practice for inclusive design in 2012. 
guess three awards. Homeless people. This is not for you. Yes, you. I went to the Design Against Crime Research Center to learn more about this bench, and I spoke to Marcus Wilcox, who is a researcher. I was pleased when I heard that Camden had made an effort to provide more seating in the city at a time when lots of other public facilities are starting to disappear from our streets and public squares. That's, that's a great thing. The critiques of that bench have come from middle class and academic sources um, who, who, who are using it as a perhaps a vehicle to express disdain over um, what I think are actually some of the other problems we have in society today, problems around lack of trust between people. I think we have problems of des using design to express that lack of trust, but I think things like CCTV and fences around parks are more of a problem than providing a bench. I suggest let's leave the Camden bench alone and let's work on some new bench. Let's work on some new provisions that work for more people. Here is another bench I've always spotted around. Why so many armrests? I think armrests are increasingly used in street furniture, especially in the UK, for the reasons you suspect. I think that armrests are used to divide spaces for people. I think they're used to control the ways that a bench can be used more intensely. Um, but while we're walking along accepting everything and only thinking about what's on our phones and we're not thinking about the importance of a journey or who's around us during a journey, then I don't think that anything's going to change. Friendly wouldn't be the first word I'd ascribe to this city. <laughs> it has lots of skill, it has lots of energy, it has lots of capacity, it has money for some people, for the top 1%. Um, it has lots of problems. Um, I think it's, it's been chasing its tail in terms of being a friendly city, as you say. Uh, we need to work harder at being more creative about our streets and spaces. While some are building anti-homeless furniture, others are rebuilding lives. Nip Nip is a commercial company that repairs and services bicycles in London. They offer build-a-bike courses to the homeless of St. Mungo's, one of Britain's largest homeless charities. They also give these special clients a free bike at the end of their course. Glenn Barnard is the head of training at Nip Nip. He met the founder of this company when he was still homeless and working for a bike repair shop. This is Matt here and this is Dalta. And this is the guy who was homeless for a good nearly 10 years. Within two and a half years, two years. That ain't bad to change someone's life around. I say 99% they would keep the bike and I've seen the bikes myself. Because basically they built something up with a frame up there and it's their own creation. While they're building that actual frame, they're building their lives up each week as well. And the bike becomes a commuting bike, cheap, affordable, what they, they've got. Um, hands on skills if anything goes wrong with it, with their bike and they can go to other co colleges, recovery, parts in, in, in London. After, after the fireplace is up, they think it's all over. I said, no, 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 you, you're quite wrong. I said, this is the beginning, the real beginning of your life here. Um, basically, step by step, panning it out. What's, what's, what's the date today? Please? Today is my birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. Happy Bas uh, basically, um, Ed come on one of our courses, um, for five weeks course. And what, what, what I said to him, I said like, do you want to do a bit of teaching, a bit of coaching and all that, and have a go? I really loved this, um, the different people that you get coming onto the course. I think it's taught me in life, you should never judge a book by its cover, but Brilliant. even more so, when someone comes onto the course, they've got 
all sorts of issues. So when you kind of get to know them, it kind of gives you um, a sense of, sense of fulfillment that when they leave, or even as they're engaging, you see their confidence all of a sudden go from sort of low to high. There is chances out there for people if they really want it. Steve Huggins is a trainer at the Multi-Skills Workshop, which is Nip Nip's next door neighbor. Here, the homeless of St. Mongo's Charity can learn new skills, which they can use to find a paid job. We've moved into this building to become the Multi-Skills about, about a year ago now. Uh, it was just a painting and decorating studio over in Hackney. We managed to start downstairs and we've expanded and added um, kitchen fitting bathroom fitting, plumbing, uh, lock fitting, some basic carpentry. There's more and more skills among our client base that we could, we could nurture and grow, making them uh, more, making it easier for them to get jobs, I think. Our job, is, our job role as a tutor, um, realistically, we're probably life coaches, skills coaches, uh, Friends. We're builders, they open up to us, you know, rather than a key worker sitting there going, right, ticking boxes, we'll sit there and listen to them with the empathy that they deserve, but also the understanding that we know how they're feeling today. They see you maybe in some of your smart clothes and you're, you've had a bit of a tan and they go, oh, you don't know, uh, uh, you don't know, I'm thinking, let me sit down, let me talk to you about what I don't know and where I was and the times I've tried to kill myself through my addiction and sexual abuse I suffered as a child. So I ended up in a treatment centre. You know, my life then started to change from the day that I stopped. Break time, guys, please. Break for 10 minutes. I think that's why I've stayed still the trainer and still coordinator is, is because I don't want to lose touch of, of how I got here. Um, there's an utmost certain amount of joy that you can bring in to seeing these guys come in in the first few weeks with their head down, not being able to look you in the eye, uh, to, to, to some of the stuff that you've seen today with people walking around smiling and happy and sitting outside and laughing and joking. They weren't like that when they walked in, you know, and that's what we've got a chance to do with these guys is to rebuild them. So I don't really want to be moving too far um, and move in touch of, of what brought me here, of what keeps me here, what gets me up every day is seeing a change in other people, in the clients that we've got downstairs, and I think that's why I'd probably stay where I am. In the same building lies the St. Mongo's office. Kristin Ayers, the train and trade manager, checks on her clients at Multiskills and Nip Nip on a daily basis. Okay, so myself and Avril are going to be going up there. We look at our clients uh, uh, in, on a journey and it is about looking at um, the holistic approach, which is often what we have, we call our recovery approach. So it is addressing the issue of them on the streets and rough sleeping, but it's also addressing any other issues, again, hope, like you know, housing and relationships. Having mental health issues, being affected by substance and misuse issues, it could be anybody. So this kind of thing about being three, check, three paychecks away from being homeless, you lose your job, and actually something like that that one thing, that one trigger, can cause a person to become homeless and then end up rough sleeping. And this is actually, uh, I believe, an installation that's done by our clients. And this just basically was um, looking at, uh, yeah, just things to feelings, thoughts, um, kind of issues that impact and affect our clients in terms of uh, becoming homeless. There are various ways, obviously, that they can help obviously through reporting um, any concerns about rough sleepers or kind of um, donating um, through a great street fundraising team. Um, you know, and, and often I've done it when it's really cold, um, particularly in the winter time when they're rough sleeping, buying them a tea, buying them a sandwich, you know, buying them some foods. You know, these are short things you can do. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, and I think that even just down to kind of, you know, acknowledging acknowledging somebody, taking away that perception that you can't do something, there's always something you can do. But also with St Mungo's, we, we have services that can support that long-term um, intervention. 
if you want to get off the street, you need to do something about it. You can't just sit around and wait for people to hand you things. You've got to go up there and, and do it and ask people and talk to people. This lamppost they had, uh, is run on residual biogas, methane, poo. It's what we flush out of the toilets, basically. In 1870, they had 200 of these lampposts in the city of Westminster, but they've taken 199 away. And now they're looking for alternative fuel, and they had it in London, and they've got rid of it. <laughs> this is Westminster Council for you again. <laughs> they're totally losing it. They do. If you're proactive, you get somewhere. What did I do? I talked to people. I started selling the big issue. I was knitting. I was knitting before I started selling the big issue. And now I do walking tours. It's progress. <laughs> and I won't change it for the world. <laughs> I'm very happy with my tours. Okay. Viv is now heading back to her new home, a council flat she moved into last year with her new partner. Okay. Have a good life now. Tour guiding, pottering about, doing a bit of cooking, reading, whatever. Enjoying myself. Just do what you want to do. Surround yourself with nice people. I'm going to finish classes next week and thank God a friend of mine saved my life. This is the third place I've been to in one week time. The most important thing is that I'm surrounded by good people. My flatmates are very nice and like we say in Arabic, a paradise is worthless without good people. See you soon. Hopefully not in the streets nor in a random room.